A baby is born. A new life, totally unique, comes into being. Once in a terrible while, something goes wrong. A baby is born with a broken heart. It is called a congenital heart defect, or CHD, and it is the most common type of birth defect. It happens every 15 minutes somewhere in America. Even if their defect gets repaired, children with CHDs are never cured. They face lifelong risks of health problems like heart failure or stroke, and the possibility of multiple open heart surgeries over their lifetime. Here is the reality despite these facts. Research into these birth defects is drastically underfunded. Of every dollar the government spends on medical funding, only a fraction of a penny is directed toward congenital heart defect research. But there is great hope on the horizon, and it has a name, the Children's Heart Foundation. It is the country's leading organization solely dedicated to funding life-saving CHD research. They've contributed nearly $14 million to this research, and it has had a dramatic impact. Survival rates have gone up, and death rates have dropped by almost 38%. Come with us now and meet some of the people behind this extraordinary endeavor. My mom had a normal pregnancy. She had the ultrasound, she did everything right, and nothing showed up. So it wasn't until shortly after I was born, I was starting to go a little bluish, which means you're not getting enough oxygen. Shortly after I was born, they called the cardiologist because I, I guess they did some sort of echo to figure out that I didn't have the left side of my heart. That's called hypoplastic left heart syndrome, HLHS. I was four days old when I went into my first heart surgery. The Jessicas of the world, they're otherwise normal people. They were just missing one of their main heart pumping chambers. She was about seven pounds, and she had the softest little cry. It sounded like a cat, a little cat meowing. It was just scary. In 1983, they didn't have a lot of information to give me. She didn't have the left side of her heart, and so the right side had to do all the work. If there's no intervention, it won't be very long. It might be days, it might be weeks. I hear stories of babies born with HLHS and they don't make it to surgery. I first learned about the Children's Heart Foundation on the back of the door at the doctor's office. He closed the door and there was a poster and back when she was born, there was no support. There was nothing. There was nobody to talk to. And I got very interested and thought maybe this is a way I can connect with other people. My mom found support. I grew up with the organization and my sister played. Congenital heart defects are very common. They are the number one birth defect in the United States. Every 15 minutes, a baby is born with congenital heart defects in this country. 25% of these babies will have their first surgery in their first year of life. So this is a very devastating defect for families and for individuals. We do need survival rates to continue to go up. The mission of the Children's Heart Foundation is to advance the treatment 
diagnosis and prevention of congenital heart defects by funding the most promising research. Twenty years ago, when I had a baby with a congenital heart defect, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, he survived and thrived, and I just want to show you who he is. Can you come up here for a second? <laughs> so, this is my son, Drew. So, Bubba Drew, this is the direct impact of congenital heart defect research, and it is what we are funding today with, um, with all the proceeds from our walks. We desperately need more research. So there's plenty of ideas out there. There's plenty of brilliant researchers doing phenomenal work. We don't get the research dollars that, that adults do. The Children's Heart Foundation evaluates hundreds of research proposals each year and is then able to select the best and the brightest, the ones with the most hope for really advancing children's heart medicine. This is phenomenal work. I only wish that we had more organizations like them so that we could make even greater advances uh, in our field. You, know, you make it clear the importance of research funding, and that's what we're here for today. That's what we're walking for. So thank you so much for bringing us such great information. My mom would say, without the research that the Children's Heart Foundation has done, I wouldn't be here. The heart has four valves, and really, the heart is really a central pump, and it's, it's fairly simple. It works just like plumbing. What you want is you want blood to come into the heart, a valve to close. So when the heart squeezes, it goes out of the heart, and we don't want it to go backwards. We want it all to be directional, just like the pipes in our house. And to do that, we have two valves on the left side of the heart and two valves on the right side of the heart. Turns out, in congenital heart disease, for children who are born with their heart problems, we see a lot of problems on the right side of the heart, the side of the heart that pumps blood to our lungs. Ethan's heart defect is a coarctation of the aorta. There was a constriction in the aorta that was so small that that blood was unable to flow through it. As an effect of that, his heart was having to pump um, even more, so it just slowed down and just slowed down, and his left ventricle became so large from having to work so hard, they went in and actually cut that piece out of his aorta and did an end-to-end -end repair. And it's a heart defect that could happen again, especially as he grows. I found Children's Heart Foundation by just doing research, learned about how common heart defects were, also learned about how important research is because the intervention that Ethan had is fairly new. Last 20 years, they've started doing procedures like this that allow children with heart defects to have interventions that allow them to have a quality of life physically that they never had before. And these children and young adults can grow into old age. There was a time when children like Ethan would not have made it because they weren't doing surgeries like this on children. The Children's Heart Foundation was founded by Betsy and Steve Peterson, who lost their son Sam to a congenital heart disease in 1996. During a time when really there weren't many resources available, since 1996 we have funded over $14 million in research. The results have been improved lives, more longevity, different treatment modalities, devices. We're thinking about things like how can we fix these babies' hearts without opening their chest or reopening their chest, which is so common um, with these diseases. Since 2000, we've been able to offer an increasingly better uh, transcatheter solution. One of the areas where interventional cardiology has grown has been in the, in the realm of valve therapy, where we can not only intervene to make narrow valves open better, but we now have the ability to replace heart valves in a lot of patients non-surgically. 
So historically, when a child or a young adult needs their pulmonary valve replaced, they go to the operating room. They have traditional open heart surgery and midline sternotomy. When we offer children a, a transcatheter solution, we're able to make a quantum shift from that. We put them to sleep with general anesthesia, but the only incision they have is about a half a centimeter incision in the groin, in the top of the leg. And through that, we pass a catheter, a long plastic tube, which we're watching on TV and we can drive very accurately watching on television monitors. We can implant a valve through that plastic tube. So to be able to offer these children comparable, if not better results than what we get with open heart surgery, but only to have a Band-Aid on your leg has really been a major accomplishment, I think, in our field. So Jack is now roughly 20 years of age. I first met him uh, three or four years ago. Um, he was referred to, to me for pulmonary valve replacement consideration by his primary cardiologist. Jack has, uh, his underlying diagnosis is what's called tetralogy of flow. One of the most common forms of congenital heart disease. In the United States alone, there's roughly 1,500 to 2,000 patients born per year with tetralogy of flow. The treatment in infancy is surgical repair. The surgeons uh, take the infants, they put them on cardiopulmonary bypass, they open up the heart, they close the hole in the heart, and open up the outflow tract, the connection between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery so that it's not obstructed. So successful tetralogy of flow repair leaves you with, in most cases, an unobstructed connection between the right ventricle and the pulmonary arteries, but no functioning pulmonary valve. So you have you, the, the heart squeezes and pushes the blood forward in an unobstructed way. But when the heart muscle relaxes, that substantial volume that you push forward is allowed to fall backwards as regurgitation back into the heart chamber. And that's called pulmonary regurgitation. So Jack, like most patients who had tetralogy flow repair, is doing fantastic. But by the time I met him three or four years ago, his heart was starting to dilate in response to that regurgitation. There was backflow. So as a result of that backflow from the faulty valve, the one chamber of my heart was becoming enlarged. So the, the valve corrects the backflow, which A, stops the expansion of that chamber of the heart, and then B, allows for the muscle to self-correct and the heart to kind of go back to normal size. So that was the end goal of having a properly functioning valve for me so that my heart doesn't get too big. Over time, patients with severe pulmonary regurgitation end up the right pumping chamber gets big. They start to have symptoms. It can be fatigue and other things. It could be arrhythmias. Well, the only option until not that long ago was to go back to the surgeon where they would go on bypass again and they'd put a surgical valve in, a pulmonary valve in. That was the only option, so he had to go back to surgery. So the Harmony valve was designed for these patients uh, that have severe pulmonary regurgitation as, an, as a non-surgical option to restore the function of the pulmonary valve. It's typically one night in the hospital and you're now in a position where if you can get the valve safely implanted the way we've been able to in the trial, these hearts recover very rapidly because you get rid of that pulmonary regurgitation. Suddenly all the extra volume that your heart has been dealing with just goes away when the heart begins to remodel in a positive way. And our hope is that using the Harmony in these sort of late teenage years or early teenage years, our patients are going to be have healthier hearts in the longer term because of the Harmony valve. Well, it's the right option for me because I didn't want to be 18 years old and get an open heart surgery. That would have been, I don't know, probably a week in the hospital and then it, at a minimum a three month recovery from open heart surgery. My goal in participating in this is that I think that these patients, patients like Jack, should have a normal life expectancy. They should have normal life functionality. 
And if we can interrupt pulmonary regurgitation and do it in a way that's not completely disruptive to their lives and requiring months and months of recovery, in my mind, I think they're gonna be an important tool in getting patients from you know, their teenage years up into their 50s and 60s with the least amount of open heart surgery as possible. I don't know where the technology is gonna be 10 years from now. Maybe I only have to do it one more time and I'm good for the rest of my life. Or if I live till I'm 100, I have to get a valve replacement every 10 years. I am very excited about um, these new technologies. I'm very excited about the Harmony Valve uh, because, uh, because for me, it was sort of a coming together of patients and doctors and industry focused on a, on a real problem that uh, we sort of worked our way through logically and with everybody's participation, thus far has been a tremendous success. The Fontan is the uh, end physiology or end circulation that a child ends up with that has a single pumping chamber. Through uh, two or three operations, a child ends up with a circulation where they have one pump that pumps to the body and no pump to the lungs. And it's possible to live with that. Actually, pretty miraculous that a person can live with that. But in reality, it's a uh, circulation that's inefficient. We went to the hospital and the doctors said, okay, tell everybody you love them. They asked her if she wanted to ride in or be wheeled in or walk. It looked like a scene out of a movie. 24 hours later, she had a new heart. We've funded Dr. Rodefell twice now. Dr. Rodefell's research is concerning a blood pump that sits in the Fontan so that a single ventricle patient is able to have the blood flowing in and flowing out as if they had a whole heart. This would allow the individual to not have to have a transplant surgery later on. This is a version of the advanced prototype that the current uh, NIH funding is based on. The Children's Heart Foundation saw hope in the work and they uh, saw the potential of the work. That level of funding uh, really, you know, was the wind in the sails to get this to the next level. You can see the, the four-way connection and in the center of that is a spinning disc. Uh, it looks like a two-sided cone and it has an electrical motor embedded in the center of it. The pathways through here have to be wide open so that if this ever fails, it will not block flow. The solution in about five years of head scratching was to put the motor in the center rather than on the outside as an inside out motor. To me, it's a relatively bulletproof solution because it restores normal physiology. Just the knowledge that I could take an idea, it really, it's, it's not my idea, it's, it's nature, and find a way to recreate that to improve health and potentially double the lifespan of these people, um, you know, it'd be uh, very exciting. When I understood that Jessica was a single ventricle patient who had had a transplant, I uh, instantly knew what she had been through. I knew that she had been through Fontan uh, palliation and that that had failed and that she was able to get a transplant and now she's doing well. 
So I asked her, I said, tell me how you felt when your Fontan was failing. And she described to me very powerfully that she didn't have much energy, that they feel a heaviness. That description uh, was powerful to me. So in my conversations with her, uh, I knew she clearly had walked the walk. She had been through the uh, process. She, she had survived. And this pump, in theory, if it were available uh, sooner, potentially could have applied to her. I had talked to Dr. Rodefeld about this before, and that's the feeling I know he wants for his patients with this blood pump. And it'll give them a chance to actually feel the normalcy and not have to be transplanted, um, hopefully for an even greater extended period of time. It's just really a foundation for hope and research to solve some of these issues that these poor babies are born with. I was fresh out of my master's program, I was looking for a job. We hired Jessica because she has an excellent background. She also has a great ability to work with people and volunteers. Specifically though, she's helping us to enable our research initiatives and our advocacy initiatives. I think her working at the Children's Heart Foundation is the best fit because she just gets it. She totally gets what people are going through and what she can do to help them. I believe that Jessica is motivated because she's someone who's been impacted with a CHD. I think she's able to listen with a special ear to individuals who are going through and navigating the same things that her family went through. And she's dedicated to research. She wants to find the answers. I've gotten to participate in, in some way in some phenomenal advancements and you know to see some of the kids that I treated when they were literally newborn babies getting married and going to college and having kids of their own um, it's it's very humbling to know that you've been able to to participate in that knowing that there could be something like a stem cell or, or gene therapy then hopefully being able to grow a heart one day that might impact not needing a second transplant at some point that's incredible I mean, I live for that. I've met our volunteers who have had children who are heart warriors or heart angels. They have conveyed to me their story about this organization fulfilling a great place in their life and allowing them to take action. I believe that we can solve this issue. It's going to take funding. It's going to take research. It's going to take raising awareness. But I believe that we can manage this disease through the work that we're currently doing. With death rates from congenital heart defects continuing to drop, the Children's Heart Foundation has a new goal, supporting research on the lifelong needs of the millions who are now living longer lives than ever before. For The Visionaries, I'm Sam Watterson.